Well, I want to say welcome to all the cabbages, puppies, and humans who are here this morning. We are glad you are with us today. My name is Brian Branham. I'm the lead pastor here at Liberty, and we are welcoming in our Fort Oglethorpe campus. So I want to ask all of our Highway 76 crew that's here this morning, you guys give Liberty Fort O a welcome this morning. Welcome them in. So we're all in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 this morning as we're continuing this critical cultural series that we are calling Brainwashed. And this past summer, there was a movie that came out that had an incredible premise to it. The movie was called Yesterday. And the idea of the movie was that what if the world forgot about the Beatles? So I'll go ahead and ruin the movie for you uh, this morning, but... At the beginning of the movie, there's some weird cosmic thing that happens, a solar flare or something like that, and it kind of hits the planet. And everybody but about three people forget there were the Beatles. Even the Beatles forgot the Beatles. And so this guy begins to reintroduce the world to the music of the Beatles. And if you like Beatles music, it, it, it was a really fun movie to watch. I wish they'd have done a little more with it, but uh, it was entertaining. It was really good. But what if the world forgot about the Beatles? Let me ask you a different question this morning, and I want you to imagine something with me. What if the world forgot there was a God? What would the world be like if no one ever believed there was a God? What what would the world be like if no one ever even had a concept of God? Richard Dawkins, who is a prominent atheist philosopher and writer, he says that the world would be much better off if there was no God. In fact, he says this, and I quote, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Boy, that'll wash your mouth out with soap, won't it, man? (laughs) Richard Dawkins really doesn't like the God of the Bible, and he thinks all religion, not just the Christian religion, but any concept of God is problematic for the world and has caused a lot of its problems. So how about you? What if you never had even a concept of God in your life? I know that for me, it would change my story radically. And so the direction that I want to go this morning with the sermon is not, let me prove to you there is a God. Because this group in this room this morning, you're an easy sell, right? You're, you, most of us sitting in this room, you're in church, you, 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 it wouldn't take much to show you, and you'd be like, oh yeah, that's great, whatever. But I, there's plenty of those sermons online, I've done many of those here, I, I'd encourage you to go check those out. But the direction I want to go this morning is this. I want to show you how we have to answer the big questions of life if there is no God. And remember that this idea of worldview. Let me bring you back up the foundation that we established last week. If you missed it, here's what it is. A worldview is the lens through which you view the world. It is a web of habit-forming beliefs that help you make sense of all your experiences. Through your worldview, you interpret life. It affects the way you think, feel, and live from day to day. It's your answer to the big questions of life, and everyone has a worldview. And for every single person, that worldview begins with question number one, is there a God? And the way you answer that first question makes every other decision for you. And so this morning, that's what I want to do. Now, I want to ask the question, if there was no God, if his memory was erased, if there was no knowledge, if there was no belief, how do we answer the questions of why am I here? How do I live? What's the reason for 
life. So if there is no God, what are we left with? And I want to give you four ideas this morning. If there is no God, I must have ultimate faith in science that it can answer all of my questions. If there is no God, I must have ultimate faith in science that it can answer all of my questions. We can all agree on this. We live in a fascinating world. It's very complicated. There's a lot of things out there. We have a lot of questions, and we can do a lot of things, experiments, putting things together, testing ideas and theories in order to answer our questions. And science brings about a lot of those answers that we have to the world that we actually see. And a secularist. Secularism is the idea that we ought to separate ourselves from any idea of God. Richard Dawkins is a secularist. Secularism is the idea that is pervading our culture. And secularists would say this, science would be much better off if we had no concept of God. We could do better science, real science, true science, because you don't have to pander to the idea of offending a religious person by telling them the data shows there is no God. For the secularists, they believe that you and I really only believe in God because of the things we don't understand. Religion is what we use to fill in the gaps of the things that we can't explain. And so given enough time, science will answer all the questions and there will be no need for religion. So Let's toy with this idea for a moment. Can science answer all of our questions? Let me, I mentioned the Beatles just a few moments ago, and and, uh, how many of you like Beatles music? How many of you hate Beatles music? You're going to love this next part of the sermon right here. So, (laughs) you know, take one of those Beatles songs, all right? Hey Jude, that's a great song, right? And I'm going to play it for you. I can't play a whole lot of it for you because it'll kick us off of Facebook if I play too much of it because of the rights issues and all that kind of stuff. But here's the song, right? That's groovy, isn't it? It's really good, yeah. Everybody sing with it. And make it better. Right, so, you, you know, it's, it's a great song. Now, here's the deal. Let, let's go pure science on that song. What that song is, is a group of Beatles, right? They sat down and they recorded their voice, and that voice has been translated digitally. Now it comes through a piece of technology, and this piece of technology takes that data, pushes it out this speaker. That speaker wiggles the air. Sound waves go in my ear. There are things in my eardrum that start wiggling around. It triggers my brain. My brain interprets those signals, and it says, oh, that's the song, Hey Jude. That's the pure science of a song. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you like that song? Some of y'all got problems, man. I'm doing right here, right? But, you know, the question of do you like that song has nothing to do with science. It has to do with your story. It has to do with other things. You see, science can observe and tell you what's there, but it can't tell you what to do with it. You go into a song like that, hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song, make it better. Remember to let her into your heart, then you can start to make it better. Now, that song, Paul McCartney says, was originally written for Julian Lennon, who was five years old when his parents went through a divorce, and he was trying to encourage him, and so Jules didn't sound great in the song, so he said Jude. And so he's writing to encourage him, this is really bad, but but things can get better. John Lennon says it's a song written to him, Paul McCartney saying, yeah, go after Yoko Ono and chase her, right? To me, this song is is really interesting because you know the longer you live life, bad things happen. And we don't have to have a perfect life. And the thing I love about the song is it literally saying the bad things in life can actually make it better from time to time. Let it get up under your skin. It can make it better, right? It's, so, you know, that's the idea of the song. But here's the deal. The science explains what you hear, why you hear it. But it says nothing about what you do with it. Because we're much more complicated than that. I will not play this song to my dog, Lucy, and she goes, Well, Brian, I really don't like that song. 
I've never really had a relationship in my life. Y'all kind of fixed that when I was very young, and I've never been around other little, you know, that's not, that's not going to happen, right? So we're not going to have a conversation with the dog about that. But there's something very different about humans in that there's, there's a why that science doesn't answer. Science answers how. It doesn't answer why. Science can tell you how to make a nuclear reactor. It can tell you how to make a nuclear bomb. It doesn't tell you which one is better. We have to make moral decisions. We have to make moral choices on those things. Science can tell you this is the world as it is. This is how it works. It doesn't tell you why you're here. It doesn't tell you what to do with that. And so if there is no God, you have to make a blind guess at the rest of those things. That's why Proverbs 1.7 is so important. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, the Bible is teaching you that without God, you really can't do good science. That you, you miss the biggest presupposition of them all. That, that we have a great starting point. God has created this world. He is the great lawgiver. He is the reason you can even do science. Do you realize scientists who don't believe in God have to make a faith statement right out of the beginning? That science even works? Why is it that yellow and blue make green today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? Because there's a fine-tuned consistency in this world that you can't deny. And they make a faith statement that the experiments are going to be consistent, repeatable, workable, provable. But why? And so whenever we have this idea of the starting place of God, in a world without God, science is not inexhaustible. It's horribly limited. In a world without God, we start in the wrong premise and arrive at the wrong conclusions. In a world without God, we don't know what best to do with what we found. You see, the idea that God is here gives science a much better starting and finishing place. Number two, if there is no God, if we erase a belief in God, then then we have to have ultimate faith in humans that we will eventually make the right moral decisions. If there is no God, man is left to himself. He makes his own rules. And that's exactly where secularism wants us to be. Secularism wants us to be free of moral restraint. You shouldn't tell me what to do. I shouldn't tell you what to do. Whatever is best for you may not be the best place for me. And religion is just this thing that binds us from reaching our greatest human potential. And that idea is not new. Jacques uh, Rousseau, who was a French Enlightenment philosopher who lived in the 1700s, his ideas about man's morality and government are foundational in secularism. Rousseau believed that man was essentially good and fully capable of creating his own good society. And so, and it's really hard to take a philosopher who's written numerous books, it's been analyzed over hundreds of years, and pare it down into simple statements. But here's the simplest way I can put it. The premise is twofold. One, man is essentially good. And then he wrote a book called The Social Contract. And in Social Contract, he said that there is a general will of this good man that the leaders of the society ought to fan the flames of. Whenever the the people who are good have a general will, it's the idea of government, education, institutions, to make sure that that general will is carried out. Now, I want you to think about what's happening in our nation. What is the general will? The general will of man, whenever he writes his own ideas of morality, you have a new sexual morality. You have different ideas of restraints on different things. I want you to take, and I'm I'm going to be an equal opportunist and make just everyone angry this morning. But I want you to think about the debate over gun control. Listen, not in what your opinion is, but in the way people think about it. There's one side that says, we got to get rid of all the guns. And on that side, they're saying, we've got to get rid of all the guns. And if we get rid of all the guns, then that solves man's problem. 
You see, there's no moral assessment of man in that argument because why? Man is essentially good. The problem is not the man, the problem is the gun. And then you've got the other side of the fence who says exactly that. The problem is the gun, not the man. But it's amazing to me, even as Christians, that we fail to make that moral assessment of man, that he is essentially flawed. There may not be things that need to be in his hands because we do have people who are flawed. And I know some of you are going to be, well, Brian, you want gun control and all that, and we got to we got to rise up against a tyrannical government. Hey, listen, I, I, I get that, but I don't have a tank parked next to my Honda, so, you know, I, I'm not going to have a great a, a fighting chance against a government if they want to come against me. Dude, they got missiles, y'all, right? And I'm not saying everybody's guns need to be taken away, but I'm really not sure that we need all the guns that we have. Somewhere in the middle of this is a balance, but what we do through our worldview is we miss not what the issue is, but how we process the questions. And that's so important. Notice how our society, it has become the school that morally educates your children. It's become the school that teaches your children sexuality. It becomes the school that teaches your children progressive morality. It's the school that, that teaches Human, uh, human life and, and abortion rights and all these sorts of things. Why? Because it goes back to that foundational basis. It's the responsibility of the government to fan the flames of the general will. And so that's the worldview that's setting all these things up. And the way that we're processing things in society. Let me ask this question. Is society getting morally better? Left to no religious restraint, we took God out of school, we took God out of our country, we took God out of the, out of the, the courthouse, we took God out of the, out of the, the, uh, the uh, discussions. We had sexual revolution, then came abortion, then came the collapse of the family, then came sexual confusion, then comes the drug culture, and now comes the legalization of marijuana. Why? Because that's what man morally wants. And so it becomes the agenda of the government to carry that out. Listen, we can say unequivocally that society has become more sexual, more violent, and more vulgar, not more moral. Rousseau is an interesting fellow. Even though his, his ideas are the foundation of secularism, Rousseau himself had five sons by his mistress of 16 years. He never saw any of his five sons. He actually turned them all over to the hospital to be turned over to an orphanage because he did not want to raise them. You talk about hypocrisy. And so now we have a government that protects, educates, promotes the general will of the people without God. The government, the media, the government schools, the Hollywood elites. Who's teaching your kids? You see, the idea of the Bible is that it is not the responsibility of the institutions to teach your children. It's the parents' responsibility. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, tell us this. The Lord is one. The Lord, you've got to love Him with all your heart, soul, body, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then it goes on and says, write these. These commandments on the doorposts and your gates and you're rising up and sitting down. Teach them to your children. You see, we've been duped in a society that we believe that moral teaching is going to be farmed out to an institution to carry out the general will of the people. And I promise you this, if you do that, your children will not be raised to be Christians. They will be raised to be thoroughly going secularists. We need to be careful. Proverbs 1.7 says, Despising wisdom and instruction, that we miss the foundation that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Be careful who we're farming our children out to. Number three, if there is no God, you have to have ultimate faith in government that it can solve all of our problems. In 1945, after the Second World War, 51 countries came together to found the United Nations. The purpose of the United Nations is fourfold, to keep peace throughout the world, to develop friendly relations among nations, to help nations work together to improve the lives of poor people, to conquer hunger, disease, illiteracy, to encourage respect for each other's rights and freedoms, and number four, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations to achieve those goals. 
the United Nations is the epitome of government without God. The United Nations right out of the gate said, we will not have God as a part of any of these discussions and we will solve the problems of the world. So the question is, how are they doing? How is that going? Steven Pinker, who is a Harvard psychology professor, in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Our Nature says that we are now living in the safest time in human history. There is less war, there is less violence, there is less bloodshed, and statistically, if you research this out, you will see a lot of compelling graphs that show us, yes, war between superpowers. We, we don't have that anymore. We, we do have skirmishes and state conflicts and those sorts of different things, but prior to 1945, there were much more people dying by violent war than there are right now, and so mission accomplished. But there is a definite secular agenda to control the world's population. Did you realize that the world population now is growing at half the rate that it was in 1960? And it's ironic how Steven Pinker and other secular humanists, they applaud what we have done with war, but they, can, they turn a convenient blind eye to deaths that are justly caused by things that are very much a part of their agenda. Since 1980, there have been 1.5 billion abortions worldwide. You realize if the population right now is 6 billion people, that is a quarter of the world's population that has been taken by abortion. There are 105 babies aborted every minute, which means by the end of this sermon, there will be approximately 3,000 babies who have lost their lives by abortion. Pinker takes that statistic into no account. The other statistic he takes into no account is, is that we are living in a time in which persecution is at an all-time high. There are more people dying right now due to religious persecution than at any other time in human history. Why? Why are those two things not taken into account? Here's why. Because in increased secularism, it means increased antagonism to, toward world religion. Increased secularism means increased antagonism toward humans in the definition of life, health care, food, wealth distribution. Government becomes centralized. It increases its size, and all the answers are going to be found in the government. Haven't you noticed here lately, if there's a hurricane, we ask the question immediately, what's the president going to do? That's not even the way our government's set up. But haven't you noticed, your wealth, your wages, your health, everything, we are farming that out increasingly to the government, asking, what are the people in Washington going to do to me? In even asking that question, we are surrendering our freedoms. It is not the responsibility of the government to give everything to you. That is a thoroughly secularist worldview. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 13 that we ought to have a biblical limited government that is ordained by God. The government is needed, but it's not exhaustive. The government's idea is to keep peace and harmony, to, to keep laws in which you and I can operate and do the things that we do. If we are to have true government, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so whenever we take God out of the equation, we have a government that is doomed to grow but bound to fail. And so we must be careful. Number four, if there is no God, we have ultimate faith in myself that I can find life's purpose. If there is no God, there is no objective, absolute truth. A man claims, and, and a man becomes the measure of all things. And secularism is completely comfortable with that. That's the way it ought to be. Who, are, who, is, who am I or who are you to tell me or me to tell you what to do? We ought to all make our own choices. And this is a perfect culture for social media. Because you realize what social media has done? Everyone is an expert. All we're doing is voicing our opinions and picking our opinions. We now live in a culture in which there is no expert. I'm just going to say what I want to say, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. And if you want to test it, you can test it. And here's the irony of that. 
There was a time in which you had experts who would spend their lives, devote a massive amounts of time thinking through things, testing things, re- having conversations about things, devoting themselves to things who have written these massive things we used to look at that are called books. And you used to be able to go to school and write a paper and your teacher tell you, now don't search that on the internet, you have to look that up in a book. And there can only be certain valid sources. That's not the case anymore. Now you can just Google it. Listen, this is why you will not even consider what these people have to say about God, but you'll listen to everything that guy says on YouTube about God. That's where we are. Hey, listen, we no longer test truth, we pick opinion. And we pick what is convenient to us in the moment. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Notice where the fool says that. He doesn't say it in his head. He says it in his heart. And most atheists I can, that I've experienced and talked to, I would say at the end of the day, it really has nothing to do with science. It really has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with secularism. At the end of the day, it comes down to they don't want to follow this God because they know if they believe in God, it has massive bearing on their life. It changes everything. But here's the sad state of the church. Even though we're all sitting here and we're shaking our heads saying, yeah, we shouldn't be in secularism. Yes, we don't want to espouse atheism. The truth of the matter is, is that many of us, even sitting in this room, live out a practical atheism every single day. You make moral decisions every single day as if there is no God. In your marriage, you behave as if there is no God. On the internet, we behave as if there is no God. No God. We come to church on Sunday and we are excited about that and then we walk right out the front door and live the rest of the week as if there is no God. Listen, atheism, whether we profess it or practice it, it's still the same. You may not say what you believe, but you will do what you believe. And so I want to challenge the church in this. Even though we shake our head and say, man, that's that's good stuff. I believe there's a God. I have solid core values. Man, I'm a southern country boy. I believe in all these kinds of things. But let me ask you this question. Is God your starting place for every decision that you make? That is a true biblical worldview. When this becomes the lens for everything. And that's the first question. The first question makes every other decision. How do you answer that first question? Is God very much a part of your life or not? If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, we want to take an opportunity to take the Word of God and introduce you to our Savior. You know, I I love what the Bible says in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 says that faith is not not uh, this blind leap into a fairy tale. Hebrews chapter 11 uses some interesting words. It says that faith is the assurance of, of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Assurance and conviction, what that's telling you is this. Faith is not believing in a fantasy. Faith is connecting with something that is really there, you just can't see. And if you're here this morning, you say, man, I'd love to make that faith connection. We'd love to take the Word of God and show you how to know this God who will change everything in the way you think through the world. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, we need to pray for our country. Man, the way that we're even processing the questions is completely wrong. And I realize where I am this morning in that. You come and pray. But I want every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed here in our Fort Oglethorpe campus. And if you're ready this morning to respond to the way the Lord is moving in your heart, maybe the blinders have been pulled off of your eyes and you realize, man, I am living out a practical atheism in the way I'm raising my children, in the way that I'm processing the world in the way that I'm, I'm, I'm living day to day. And you're ready to repent and rebuke that secularism in your life. You come. But I want to pray for you, and then we're going to stand together and respond to what the Lord's telling us to do this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning, and thank you that you are there. 
Lord, we can't even really ask the question, what if there was no God? The answer to that is then we would not be here to ask that question. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you pull the blinders off of our eyes, that you help us to see that our faith in you should make every other decision in our lives, that we ought to live out a truly biblical worldview. God, I pray for those who need to be saved. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together if the Lord is calling you to come? You need to pray.